good morning friends i am professor swapnil goswami and to be continued history of english literature lecture series today we are going to start on 15th century english literature and we are going to discuss here so talking about 15th century english literature at the beginning we will discuss about the poetry in this era so the period of 150 years after chaucer's death is comparatively is a blank period is a we can say that empty period in poetry in other departments the period was less unproductive in prose it produced the one great book in the title of that book was mortuary arthur written by thomas mallory this book witnessed the establishment of the drama it was in the spirit that the old beautiful english folk songs or ballads were written several explanations have been given to account for the death of good poetry in the 15th century it is said that conditions were unfavorable to poetry and the arts the wars of the roses had killed of the flower of english nobility there were no patrons this reason is not very convincing for we know that the finest work of the 14th century that of chaucer langland and gower was produced during the troubled reign of richard ii it is true that peace and prosperity are conducive to the growth of the arts but it is equally true that real genius has a way of breaking out even in the most unpropitious circumstances another theory blames the absence of first rate poetry in the 15th century on the transitional state of the english language great changes in grammar and pronunciation were taking place the changes which led over the centuries to modern english the final e which was an integral part of many words in chaucer being fully pro- pronounced counted as a syllable it was dropped in the 15th century the result was that the res- music of chaucer's verse was not appreciate it possibly his decasyllabic lines were read as octosyllabic an additional and therefore inconvenient syllable being slurred s l u w r e d over hastily however that maybe his followers imitated him without understanding the technique of his versification he was regarded as irregular and crude this misunderstanding led to their taking whatever license they pleased with their own versification the verses of his immediate followers hockley and lydgate both hockley and lydgate are little more than doggerel chaucer continued to be misunderstood at last in theory for nearly 400 years it was only in 1775 that thomas tanwit hit upon his secret in actual practice however the secret of chaucer's rhythm was restored to english verse in the middle of the 16th century by watt and surrey watt and surrey sought inspiration from italy as chaucer before them had sought it from france this explanation is sounder and more in accord with facts but perhaps the simplest explanation is that no great poet was born in england during the 15th century the wind of genius of the wind of genius blows when and where it listen so here we completed the intro of poetry in 15th century english literature now we are going to continue the lecture
and going to start about English Chaucerians. So here we find that the poets, the English poets especially of the post Chaucerian period, only three deserve names we get. First is Hocklew, second Lydgate, third one is Skeldon. Though Hocklew and Lydgate professed to be disciples of Chaucer, both are hopefully dull. Hocklew is remembered because the only portrait we have of Chaucer is by him. Lydgate is remembered for the two lines which have become a popular quotation. The third one, the personality, the third personality, the title, the name of the third personality is John Skelton. He cannot be so summarily dismissed. If only because of the interest shown in him by modern poets. If eccentricity is originality, Skelton was certainly original. He owes little or nothing to Chaucer or anybody else. His own description of his verse is reveals very detail. Because of Skelton's ragged and jagged verses, Pope called him beastly Skelton. Yet it is the roughness of his doggerel like verses matched by the roughness of his temper that seems to have attracted the moderns. His verses are called Skeltonics, S-K-E-L-T-O-N-I-C-S. His strong point is satire. His strong point is satire of the personal kind, coarse and abusive. The most interesting of his satires are Coley Clout and Why Come A Not To Court. In the first, he lashes out at clergy. In the second, at Cardinal Wolsey, who was the chief minister of Henry VIII. Though his characteristic vein was satirical, his range was wide and he was capable of tenderness and pathos. Skelton was tutor to the future King, VIII, King Henry VIII. He was a rector and a learned classical scholar, but he preferred cloning in his poems. He is hard to classify. All that can be said about him is that his poetry reflects the spirit of the dying Middle Ages rather than that of the Renaissance. So this was the English Chaucerians. Now we must talk about the Scottish Chaucerians. It, uh, it is with pleasure that the student turns from the dullness of the English poetry of the 15th century to the poetry of Scotland. It would be well, however, first to take a bird's eye view of the Scottish literature generally. The attempts of the English kings Edward I and Edward II to subdue Scotland at the end of the 13th and in the beginning of the 14th centuries united the warring Scottish clans into a nation. The national feeling thus born laid under the early Stuart kings in the 15th century to the growth of a vigorous national culture. Broadly speaking, two languages were spoken in Scotland. One was Scots spoken in the Highlands and Gaelic G -A -E -L -I -C, in the Western and Northern Scotland. We are not concerned with the Scottish Gaelic, which like the Welsh or Irish concerned with the Scottish, sorry, we are not spoken, sorry, we are not concerned with the Scottish Gaelic, which like the Welsh or Irish Gaelic belongs to the Celtic world. The Scots which, the Scot with which alone we are concerned had two phases, Old Scots and Middle Scots. Old Scots was hardly distinguishable from English spoken in Northern England. It was merely a form of English used, used in Scotland. By the 15th century, Old Scots had developed into what we call Middle Scots. This is a sort of hybrid of made-up language used for literary purpose only. At no time it corresponded to the spoken Scottish language. 
this language continued to be written until the union of the two crowns in 1603 killed it as the norman conquest had killed the anglo saxon after 1603 the scottish writers wrote in english and a native scottish literature virtually came to attain do an attempt to revive it was made by some writers notably especially robert burns in the 18th century by using the vocabulary of spoken scots do english poets fell to understand him the scottish poets proved apt pupils of chaucer his example and influence produced a succession of poets who make the 15th century the most glorious period of scottish poetry in rich maturity and artistry this truly national poetry has never after been surpassed scottish poetry may be said to begin with john barber john barber was an older contemporary of chaucer barber's poem bruce b r u c e was a spirited poem in octosyllabics it celebrates the adventures of robert bruce In this poem the personality Robert Bruce is the hero of the Scottish War of Independence his lines on freedom have become famous such as a freedom is a noble thing the minstrel the minstrel henry or blind harry who flourish in the latter part of the 15th century was a worthy successor to barber uh, henry's or blind harry's poem valles w a w l a c is a long and violently patriotic poem in decasyllabic couplets recounts the brave exploits of the early national hero neither of these poems is strictly historical but valles is almost fabulous in its exaggerations though because of its patriotic and anti english appeal it has had enormous vogue among the scots the poems are not very musical either in fact their principal recommendation is their simplicity and patriotic vigor so here we must talk about now scottish chaucerians which is very important for us so now we are going to talk about uh, scottish chaucerians so the poets who were really influenced by chaucer and who on the account are called scottish chaucerians are king james first henderson dunbar and gavin douglas so these are these are the scottish chaucerians james first robert henderson william dunbar gavin douglas so here we are going to continue So talking about firstly and uh, James one so is a uh, lifetime was 1396 to 1436 he was the first in point of time wrote the king square he wrote a king square k i n g apostrophe s square q u a i r in the seven lines stanza of chaucer uh stanza sorry it has since come to be called the rhyme royal Yes, seven lines stanza was called Rhyme Royal. While still a boy, he was captured by the English. Uh, he remained a prisoner in England. That boy was remain a prisoner in England for ninety years. That boy fell in love with a lady. In that name of the that lady was Jane Beaufort. Jane Beaufort, J A N E Jane Beaufort, B E A U F O R T Beaufort. Uh, she was. <coughs> Jen Eni, uh, sorry, Jen Beaufort was Henry Ford's niece, and that boy was married with her. Uh, the King Square, which gives a touching and graceful account of this love affair, shows marked influence of Chaucer. The description of the king's falling in love at the first sight is reminiscent of the episode in the Knight's Tale, where. the two captive knights see emily in the garden through the prison window the royal author acknowledges his debt to gower 
and Chaucer is master's dear and he shows himself a correct and accomplished versifier. This is the next one that was a, one of the greatest Scottish Chaucerians. The personality name is Robert Henderson. Robert Henderson comes after James but uh, whose dates are uncertain was a schoolmaster. He is a much greater poet than James. He is indeed the first major poet of Scotland. He is independent and original even in his imitation of Chaucer. He has great power and remarkable variety. His works consist of two serious poems of some length. The Testament of Cressidae and Orpheus and Eurydice, a collection of fables from Aesop. A -E -S -O -P, Aesop. It is about a dozen other minor poems, the chief of which is the pastoral ballad he wrote especially and there are some pastoral ballads uh, such as Robin and Makane, Robin, R-O-B-E-N-E -E and Makane, M-A-K-Y-N-E, which was included in Persis Relics, Persis Relics, R-E-L-I-Q-U-E-S. The Orpheus and Eurydice is a poem of average quality which tells the classical legends of the musician Orpheus going to Hades, H-A-D-S, to bring back his wife Eurydice. The Testament of Cressidae is Henderson's greatest poem in the serious kind. It is a sequel to Chaucer's Troilus, written in the same rhyme royal stanza. His moral sense was shocked at the idea of the faithful Troilus killed and the faithless Cressidae living happily. So he gave the story an ending which he thought was more natural and probable. First, Troilus is not dead. Second, Diomede, D-I-O-M-E-D, tires of Cressida and deserts her as she has deserted Troilus. She thereupon takes to the streets and becomes a common prostitute. Her horrible punishment comes when she is afflicted with leprosy. So she equipped with a begging ball, B -O -W -L, and clappers, she joins the band of lepers, L-E-P-E-R-S. One day, Troilus passes her way and gives her alms. Their eyes meet, but neither recognize the other. Later, when Cressidae is told who he was, she faints and dies. Before dying, she makes the testament by which she leaves her body to the worms, her begging ball and clapper to the lepers and her ring to Troilus. On receiving the ring which he recognizes as his own and coming to know of her story, Troilus grieves and raises a marble monument over her grave. The story is told with great tragic power and though the punishment Henderson gives to Cressidae is terrible. It is interpreted with tenderness and pathos, marked the skill with which the lovers meeting by the wayside. The fables written by Robert Henderson uh, shows the poet in a lighter mood and uh, they are characterized by lively touches of humor and realism. Henderson is the most characteristically Scottish of all the group in his humor as well as in his realistic description of nature which are true to the Scottish soil and not merely conventional. Now Robin and Macne, R-O-B-E-N-E and Macne, M-A-K-Y-N-E is the most popular of Henderson's poems. It is second only to the testament. It is a pastoral ballad in which at first the usual order of man pursuing women is reversed. Uh, Macne is the shepherdess. He was Robin, R-O-B-I-N, who is also shepherd. Soon, however, the tables are turned and Robin solicits her love. It is now her turn to reject the suit. She retaliates, she retaliates by reminding him of the old proverb. That proverb was the man that will notch in OCST when he may. She goes home merrily and hurt whole, a classic example of tit for tat 
in love it is a delightful ideal now next personality in scottish chaucer's was uh, william dunbar so the lifetime of william dunbar was uh, 1462 1530 she ra- he ranks first in this group he has generally been uh, acclaimed as the greatest poet of scotland second only to burns after taking his ma degree from the university of st andrews he became a franciscan friar but he was later unfrocked he was attached to the court of king james 4 king james 4 employed him on several diplomatic missions including one to england to negotiate the king's marriage to margaret tudor he was a court poet and a sort of laureate of scotland he was prolific as a poet and about a hundred poems of his are extant they are most of them short but brilliant displaying an astonishing diversity of subject and matter the more noteworthy are the thistle and the rose the golden torch the two married women and a widow the friars of berwick the flighting of dunbar and kennedy the dance of the seven deadly sins the lament for the makers so firstly we will talk about the work written by william dunbar that is the thistle and the rose thistle t h i s t l e and the rose r o s e rose <coughs> it is an allegory in rhyme royal it celebrates the marriage of james whose name in the poem is thistle t h i s t l e with margaret whose name in this poem is rose the golden tars in nine lines stanza is an allegory of love the poet in a dream visit the court of venus where he is wounded by the arrows of beauty in spite of reasons defending him with a golden targe or shield neither of these allegories is consistent they are rather playful exercises of the poet's rhetoric the language is heavily ornamented almost oriental in its splendor and the swing of meter charms the ears the two married women and widow inspired by the wife of barthdale is a scalding satire on women written by william dunbar the remarks of these three women on their husbands and on matrimony would make even the wife of bath blush the friars of berwick also reminiscent of chaucer is a scandalous tale of intrigue involving a high rank friar and farmer's wife in the flatting f l y t i n g dunbar and kennedy hurl abuses at each other such flattings or scolding matches were common among literary scots up to the 18th century the dance of the seven deadly sins in 12 line stanzas of spirited verse describes a procession of the sins personified before saturn in hell <coughs> it is stinging satire on wickedness but in a comic tone without any aim at reform or edification it is much better known than any of the poems referred to above but the best of dunbar's poems is the lament for the makers the poem laments for lament for the makers is an elegy on the dead poets most of them scotsman in which he bewails the shortness of life and the transitoriness of all earthly things this is perhaps the only poem in which dunbar is serious soft and subdued though dunbar is so versatile he appears in many roles as an allegorist, moralist, trifler, T-R-I-F-L-E-R, satirist, and buffon, B-U-F-F-O-N. It is by his satiric and humorous poems that he establishes uh, his claim to be regarded as the greatest Sco- uh, Scottish poet, next only to Burns. His greatest uh, distinction, however, lies in his metrical craftsmanship. He is a virtuous virtuoso of rhythm and style his lack of tenderness repels many readers lovers of burns 
particularly cannot take very kindly to dunbar the slogan back to dunbar raised by some modern scottish poets in a reaction against the sentimental burns is a passing phase though a chaucerian he had nothing of chaucer's wide humanity and genial humor quite apart from this the language difficulty is greater barrier not easily crossed even by scotsmen to say nothing of foreigners the following stanzas are given from the lament are easy enough and will serve to illustrate dunbar's quality such as that strong unmerciful tyrant this is the line in the poem so here the language uh, difficulty is even greater in the case of gavin douglas so now we are talking about uh, gavin douglas who, uh, who is one of the scottish chaucerians and his lifetime was uh, 1475 to 1522 and he was last uh, one in this uh, group titled scottish chaucerians so he uses uh, scots ancients and modern with latin and english words thrown in for want of equivalents in his own tongue it is very hard to follow him without constant reference to a glossary a few would take his trouble as douglas is perhaps the least important poet of this group uh, douglas was high born well educated and a bishop after the disaster of flodden f l o d d e n he was involved in political intrigues and had to flee the country he escaped to london where he died at the early age of 48 his works consist of two original poems the title of the, those original poem was the palace of honor that is one and king heart h a r t heart that is one uh on that of um, that of a uh, translation of verges a n i d a e n e i d the palace of honor reminiscent of chaucer's house of fame is an allegory in nine lines stanza it has little to recommend itself besides the orate rhetoric to common in all these scottish poets king heart or heart is a childish allegory of life in octaves uh, heart was the king living in his castle castle is a body yeah castle is a symbol of body in this poem it's surrounded by five servants means senses human senses body senses it is trapped by dame pleasance means pleasure from whom he is freed by age only to die from decrepitude d e c r e p i t u d e Douglas fame sits on rest on his translation of the A night A E N E I D written by Virgil uh, he uh, he was the first translation of this classic to appear in any british language and as such has some historical importance as anticipating the humanism of the renaissance while the experts wrangle about the merits of the translation they are all agreed about the excellence of the prologues which the translator had sorry the translator has added to the various books of the aeneid in this prologues entirely his own douglas wrote as fancy dictated of himself of his country of the seasons the prologues describes the seasons are the most interesting his pictures of winter spring and summer given respectively in prologues to books 7 12 and 13 have a luxurious of detail colors scents and sounds of the scottish landscape uncommon in the middle ages the meter used is of various kinds rhyme royal octave nine line stanza the couplet and several others the prologues are not free from rhetoric but what is worth remembering is that douglas has in a very marked degree that genuine love of nature which has always distinguished the scottish poets he very naturally reminds one of thompson his greater countryman of the 18th century so here gavin douglas is completed so now we should be continued 
15th century ballads though the 15th century is a poor in poetry it is rich in what has been called unofficial poetry and that unofficial poetry is called the ballads the origin and the date of the ballads have been furiously debated but it is fairly certain that the ballads are the shortened uh, versions of all romances not only in england but also throughout europe uh, there were the english ballads or the great majority of them were produced in the 15th century the robin hood ballads are certainly earlier they are mentioned in piers plowman but judging from the language and tone they are not earlier than the 14th century quite a large number date from the 16th and 17th centuries but they are in the nature of imitation antiques products of conscious literary art and sophistication the genian ballad has a certain primitive quality both in feeling and in treatment which constitutes its chief charm and which cannot be reproduced successfully in more modern times the word ballad is connected with dancing it is possible that the original ballads were sung or recited to the accompaniment of community dances be that as it may the ballads have the musical quality of song how you are rough their rhythm may appear in print they are just short folk tales in verse their simplicity naturalness and sincerity together with their fresh outdoor atmosphere give them an appeal which is universal and not merely local or popular a ballad is a short traditional and popular story in verse of unknown authorship as ballads were transmitted orally they have come down to us in their original form some have scores of of variants which shows that in the course of centuries they have passed through a process of adaptation alteration and modification the special ballad meter is a stanza of four lines the second and the fourth rhyming together the first and third lines have four and the second and fourth lines have three iambic feet the first collection of ballads was made by bishop thomas percy in his book relics of ancient poetry published in 1765 this was followed by sir walter scott's border minstrelsy towards the end of the 19th century professor child of harvard published his english and scottish popular ballads which is the largest collection the student uh, is advised to read at least the following ballads uh, first is robin hood robin hood and the curtal friar second chevy chase third nut brown maid and the last one sir patrick spens so at the beginning we will discuss about robin hood and the curtal friar c u r t a l curtal friar f r i a r so this is one of the most amusing of the ballads centering around this famous outlaw there is a good deal of horse play between two at first then they fight and robin hood being worsted blows three blasts on his horn at which 50 of his archer archers appear the curtal uh, friar then putting his fist to his mouth emits three hoots at which 50 curtal blood hounds appear two of the dogs tearing up robin hood's cloak c l o a k uh, it is a battle royal is joined between the two groups when 10 of his dogs are killed and friar accepts defeat and ills to robin hood the next poem that is chevy chase c h e v y c h a s e chase okay so this is the most famous of the ballads it has been called a little epic it describes in a purely martial style the gallant fight between two border lords percy of northumberland and douglas of scotland the incident is historical or at least semi historical yes and uh, that incident took place early in the 15th century percy defies douglas by hunting in the enemy territory 
द इनएविटेबल फाइट टेक्स प्लेस एंड डगलास इज स्लैन एस एल ए आई एन द सीन ऑफ पर्सी ग्रीविंग ओवर द डेड बॉडी ऑफ हिज एस्ट वाइल एनिमी एंड एडमायरिंग हिज वर्थ हैज अ टच ऑफ पैथोस एंड ज्वेलरी विच इज स्ट्रेंजली मूविंग सर फिलिप सिडनी इन हिज एपोलॉजी फॉर पोएट्री पेड दिस बैलाड अ हैंडसम ट्रिब्यूट वेन ही सेट I never heard the old song of Percy and Douglas that I found not my heart more moved than with a trumpet and yet as he goes on to say its style is so crude and unadorned indeed it was the roughness of its meter and style coupled with genuine feeling that appealed so much uh, to the romantics the nut brown maid is the next ballad it shows a greater metrical skill and its truth and tenderness of feeling is the very essence of poetry the maid is a baron's daughter she is tested like griselda g r i s e l d a for constancy in love her lover mm, who she thinks her lover is an ordinary square comes to bid uh her farewell he has killed a man he has killed a man and f- and must flee the girl does not care and even when he says he has another mistress she remains unshaken in her resolve to follow him having passed the test she learns that the skier is really an early son who will make her a countess there is a next ballad in 15th century uh, sir patrick spence sir patrick p a t r i c k spence s p e n s uh, this ballad tells the story of the ill fated expedition sent out by the king of scotland to bring home the maid of norway on the return voyage the ship under the command of sir patrick spence sir patrick spence was uh, a famous sailor s a i elwar <coughs> sorry he is <coughs> he is break in a storm and all on board are lost now there is a next one that is a 15th century english literature prose so we will talk about after some time so we are going to continue uh, in talking about 15th century english literature and here we will continue the lectures is on uh, now we will start prose yes prose english prose in the 15th century especially so the prose of the 15th century was still in a preparatory stage it offers little that has literary or artistic interest beyond the work of two authors and those two authors were thomas mellory and berners b e r n e r s it was a period of preparation during which english prose was exercised by being put to various uses for example romance history law politics and theological controversy for the most part the learned wrote in latin the inter, uh, the international language which was still the favorite the native language was in fluid state formless and indefinite in its grammar and vocabulary it was changing so rapidly that caxton the first english printer who set up his printing press in 1476 he found the language in his old age very different from what it had been in his childhood he was not certain what kind of language would be generally understood or would please the public in poetry chaucer had provided a model but not great writer had provided such a model prose uh, for prose caxton loved poetry and printed chaucer's works as well as those of lydgate and gore but he was uh, fascinated by french prose 
and wanted to achieve the same clarity and grace in english besides he was a businessman who wanted to make a living and in the fast increasing educated class there were more readers of prose than poetry though not a great s- scholar he was a lover of books and being enterprising he himself undertook the work of providing his reading matter mostly by translating french romances <coughs> william caxton is an important figure in the history of english prose for he is stimulated and in part satisfied the appetite of the new generation of readers for prose stories it was he who printed thomas miller's mortady arthur destined to become the greatest book of the 15th century of other writers the briefest mention is all that is possible in this history nobody today will waste his time over peacock's represser of or much blaming of the clergy uh, the represser of uh, or much blaming of the clergy is the book written by thomas uh, written by peacock it uh, is a defense of orthodoxy against the attacks of wycliffe and his followers sir john fortes treatise on the governance of england may interest constitutional pundits or british patriots but there is one passage in it which has become famous for its chauvinism contrasting the fearless independence of the english with the cowardly slavishness of the french sir john extols even english highwaymen robbery implies courage but the french are too cowardly even to rob or steal the sentence is argued by him the spelling of this chief justice of england is the most grotesque in this age of fanciful spelling it is customary to include in the prose of this period in that prose title was past on letters p a s t o n letters you know very well this is a collection of letters exchanged between members of a middle class family over the period 1422 to 1509 uh, they are ordinary letters concerned with the business of living buying and managing proper uh, property lawsuits and like there is nothing literary about them and they cannot be classed as literature so we come to melory and burners melody's uh, mortady arthur was printed in 1485 by william caxton william caxton says that the manuscript was given he given melody by sir thomas melody yes and thomas melody was the knight uh, caxton says uh, uh, says that it uh, the book have been a lancastrian and a member of parliament he died in 1471 his book a translation from a large number of french sources it is the largest single collection of arthurian legends in english it is easy enough for criticism to pick holes in this book to say that it is a loose compilation which has no unity of theme or plot but considering the vast and scattered material material that melory had to deal with one cannot but admire the skill and discrimination with which he reduced such a heterogeneous mass to a coherent sequence as regards unity the book has a higher unity than that of thought or plot namely the unity of tone and atmosphere the atmosphere of the fairy tale of the magical and the marvelous and of a twilight melancholy is all pervasive what is more the book sums up in itself all the virtues and vices of the age of jewelry real or fancied melody writes in a style of childlike simplicity which sometimes becomes childish we get a succession of sentences beginning with <coughs> beginning with then and then and so then 
the book is a full of castles tournaments heroic battles and single combats it is apt to become ty- tiresome to the modern reader but the author is intent on telling his story without a trace of self conscious elaboration mm, or finesse the result is a poetic prose well suited to its pro- purpose and this is the highest merit of style the charm of the book has <coughs> the charm of the book has never been denied do roger achiam <coughs> a s c h a m condemn it on the ground of morals for the laws of launcelot l a u n c e l o t and guinevere g u i n e v e r e are sinful um, both launcelot and guinevere are held up as idol lovers <coughs> the puritanical criticism is based on mis understanding to to tradition of old romances melody portrays courtly or chivalric morality not religious morality such contradictions are part of the unreal world of chivalry all in all thomas melody's mortality author is the greatest book in prose or verse between chaucer and spencer besides its intrinsic worth it is the one great storehouse of those myths and legends of king arthur which have had such fascination for english poets especially tennyson's who ideas of the whose ideas of the king are almost entirely based on mortality arthur's <coughs> so here we shall continue and the next uh, writer that is uh, that person it is uh, is uh, Uh, lord burners so we shall now discuss about him lord burners <coughs> so his lifetime was 1467 to 1533 the second great writer of this century lord burners and he was for some time lord chancellor and then governor of calais c a l a i s the most notable of his many translation from french are Froissart Chronicles and Huon of Bordeaux not less notable is his golden book of Marcus and Relictus Marcus M A R C U S and Relict A N R E L I U S uh, it is a translation from the spanish of Juvara uh, G U E V A R A Froissart's Chronicles uh, became a source book as well as a model for future historians like Hall and Honeychet. Froissart was a French historian. His book deals with the affairs of France, Flanders, England, Spain, and Portugal during the 14th century. Huon, H U O N of Bordeaux, B O R D E A U X, is a French romance of the 13th century. It is important as the first book to introduce Oberon, the fairy king. With his help, Huon, H U O N, achieved apparently impossible adventures in the reign of Charles Magne, C H A R L E M A G N E. His golden bull and golden bull of Marcus Aurelius was the first work of highly ornate prose, which soon became fashionable and ultimately led to euphemism with him we are at the threshold of humanism and he may be regarded as a link between the two ages so now there is a last one drama in the 15th century so talking about drama in the 15th century it is a barren yes in is because the, the drama made its appearance as a distinct and well established form of english literature in the 15th century the consideration of this subject how you must be reserved for a later chapter so we will discuss the drama in the 15th century in detail after that so you here i want to uh, so now here we will continue in the lecture and next one the renaissance age so talking about the renaissance age 
the meaning of renaissance we must know that it's the beginning in italy with french and boccaccio in the 14th century the discovery of classical uh, latin literature of virgil ovid and cicero the capture of constantinople the last uh, stronghold of greek culture and the turks and the flight of greek scholars westward the welcome so he has some points so here we must talk about the origin and concept of renaissance so so the end of the 15th century marks the end of the middle ages we now enter upon a new era that of the renaissance before considering the literature of renaissance in england we must first try to understand the new tendencies in the life and thought of the english people that was a renaissance brought so we will discuss the renaissance age uh, in the next lecture so yeah, i i want to conclude uh, thank you see you